What's going on everybody? I'm Jory Goodman, The Time Teller. Welcome to another installment of Microbrand Monday. Very, very excited about this episode and I had some fun putting together this little backdrop here. We have uh, my grandfather's World War II sidearm holster. He was a physician in the US Navy. He was a commander in the United States Navy during World War II. I have this 1945 Joseph Rogers and Sons Sheffield, England uh, Royal Military Knife. Uh, we have some <laughs> 762 by 39 rounds just kind of scattered about. We have a buck knife, we have a Zippo lighter, everything very rough and tumble here today. Uh, what does this have to do with today's episode? Well, when we look back in time and we think of watches that have played a part in various historical events, we're often drawn towards wartime watches. And when we think of wartime watches, we often think of something like this, right? Something that resembles the original hack watch. Oftentimes, it's a smaller, simple field watch, no real complications outside of the ability to hack, right? So you can synchronize the watch to another external time source. Um, let's see, matte black dial. This Hamilton khaki field mechanical, the 38 millimeter, it's kind of a celebration to that original hack watch. It has patinated hands and indexes. It kind of looks old and rugged. Um, looks like it's aged a bit and seen some things. Uh, I'm wearing it on a Wrist Candy Watch Club nylon strap. Special thanks to Wrist Candy Watch Club for sponsoring the channel and supplying me with these straps. Um, but yeah, when we think of wartime watches, we think of the archetype, the iconic silhouette of a simple field watch. But then nowadays, you know, when we think of the modern warrior's watch, we think of things that are a bit more high tech. G-Shocks, Suntos, Garmin's, uh, Protex, things like that. Things that are a little bit more involved, a little bit more digital and modern. Uh, but the truth is, we wouldn't have these modern watches without something much, much more simplified like this. But what if we go even further back in time to an era just before World War II? What if we look at a watch that's from World War I? Now that's a bit different. It's 10, 15 a.m., let's get down to business. That's right guys, in this little watch pod clamshell thing is a Vario 1918 trench watch. Now Vario has assured me this is not going to be the production packaging, so if you do choose to purchase one of these watches, it's not going to come uh, just inside of this, you know, little watch pod. It's going to actually have proper packaging, but this is a pre-production model. This is a review piece that gets passed around to reviewers like me. So let's take a look at the Vario 1918 trench. All right, here we are with the Vario 1918 trench watch. Now, for the first few moments I've had this in my hands, I can totally see the kind of historical events that dictated Vario's design choices with this watch. Now, let's talk about something very interesting, okay? Back in the 19-teens, wristwatches for men, not super common, okay? Here's why, men, their clothing had pockets, okay? It just, it comes down to that. Men had pockets in their vests, in their jackets, in their pants, so they could wear a pocket watch affixed to a chain. Um, women, their clothing, you know, with pockets, it was kind of unheard of. So women wore things called wristlets, and it was a wrist-worn timepiece. So back then, for the most part, uh, for a man to even consider wearing a watch on his wrist, oh, that was quite feminine. No, 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 I, I use a proper pocket watch. Uh, but then when war broke out and the officers were finding themselves having to dig around their various pockets to pull out their pocket watch, and then of course back then Roman numerals uh, were what was very common, uh, they found themselves just being very difficult to tell the time and it was very cumbersome and um, you know back in World War I trench warfare that sounds like an enormous nightmare. So with everything going on with all the equipment they had trying to pull out a pocket watch with Roman numerals it just could not be a thing. So uh, you know they started bringing in wrist worn timepieces as we know them wristwatch and uh, they ditched Roman numerals, they picked up these big bold Arabic numerals, much more easily visible, much more legible, and uh, the officers had a much better time telling the time. 
Who would have thunk? Now, one really fun design choice I wanna bring up is that they chose to put this watch on a bun strap. Now, if you wanna learn more about the history behind the bun strap, click up here, top right corner. I made a whole episode dedicated to it. But why would a bun strap with all this extra material be preferable to someone fighting a trench war? Uh, well, it's because in the cold of night or in the heat of battle, uh, this extra piece of material here in between the watch head and your wrist, you know, it's going to protect you uh, from any irritation or extreme environments. Now, another really cool benefit is uh, that this watch has fixed lugs, okay? There's no spring bar in there or anything. So uh, if this watch gets hung up on a piece of equipment or a strap or, you know, a piece of the, you know, environment around you, the watch head is gonna be a lot less likely to pop off the strap than if it were to use some form of spring bar. Uh, now, how do you take it off the strap? Well, you just slide the strap off of that extra piece of material and you can actually unscrew uh, this extra flap here. Just gave you a sneak peek of that movement. We're gonna talk about that more in a moment. Okay, so I wanna bring up one last thing about this overall design before we talk about the specs and uh, you know the measurements and everything like that. So I wanna talk about the four o'clock crown positioning uh, because I think with the influx of Seiko divers and a lot of other watches utilizing that four o'clock crown, uh, we kind of take it for granted. We don't really see a function to it. We just think, oh, that's kind of an interesting design choice. But the truth is there is some functionality to it. So. Most watches utilize a three o'clock crown position. That's very common, makes it very easy to set the time on the fly, whatever. Uh, the truth is, with that crown being at the widest point of the watch's head, uh, it's a vulnerability, okay? Because not only does that protrude just that much more and it can get hung up on the environment around you, or whether it be, you know, rocks or uh, branches, or again, the equipment you have on your person, whether it be straps or coat sleeves or whatever, um, it also could get knocked, like it could sustain a direct hit, and then when that crown gets hit, that crown stem could break inside the watch, and then it's a huge headache, and your watch is effectively just broken. Moving that crown just a little bit further down to the four o'clock, you'll notice it's not in line with the widest point of the watch case. It's now just tucked away that much more, making it a little bit more resilient of a watch. Now, this watch specifically utilizes a threaded crown or a crown that screws into the watch head. When most people think of that, they think of, oh, okay, it has a nice water resistance rating. And it's true, a screw down crown does help mitigate water uh, from getting into the watch, but also it creates a more rigid structure. So if you do find a way to hit that crown, the force is dispersed in the watch case versus it just hitting the crown and breaking off inside the watch case. So very, very cool. And again, just something I wanted to bring up when we're looking at this World War I watch. I almost said World War II, but that's this one on my wrist. This baby's World War I. All right, guys, so speaking of that crown, you'll notice the entire episode, I have not unthreaded it, I haven't wound it up, I haven't done anything to that crown, and the watch is alive. It's ticking away on its own just from this short period of time, me handling the watch. Uh, it's gotten the second hand moving. So that can only mean this is an automatic watch. And when we look at the spec sheet that I have here in my hot little hands, it is in fact powered by a Miyota 82S5 automatic movement. It does have hacking and hand wind. We're gonna test that out in a moment. 21 joule automatic movement from Miyota there. Of course, Miyota is currently owned by Citizen. Now, what do I think of this dial as we get up close. Well, there's some definite old school cues. One thing I really like is this contrast between the clean whiteness of the dial and then of course those patinated, kind of custardy, uh, big, bold Arabic numerals and the very old school handset. Some people don't really like patination. Um, I think even those people give this watch a pass because again, it's, it's more of a color choice. It's more of a contrast. So you can really see those big, bold, numerals against that clean white dial. But what say you? Um, I personally really, really dig it. Uh, let's go ahead and kind of inspect some other areas of this watch's dial. But first, let's move that handset around. And uh, while we're at it, we can test the crown setting and function. All right, so as I go ahead and get a grip of this very old school oversized onion crown, let us unthread it. You get a better grip under this bun strap. 
All right, pretty smooth threading, honestly. Let's thread it up once again so I can really get a feel for it. Yeah, very smooth threading, no complaints there. Let's, let's feel the crown setting and function. Let me see, if we pay attention, you know what, I'm gonna move the handset around first. Let's move it away from that sub dial. Okay, you can see it's moving. Pull the crown all the way out, very positive click on uh, the final setting and the second hand has stopped. So this surely does hack. Let's feel if there is resistance. I'll put it up to the mic real quick. So it absolutely hand winds as well. Everything feels slick and smooth, nothing gritty or grainy. Very positive tactile click when we are pulling that crown out. Love to feel that. Okay, let's thread it up. And no real play in it. It has a definite final stop there when you're done threading. Um, yeah, no complaints. Very, very comfortable crown setting. Uh, let's go ahead again. I told you we'd inspect this dial. Let's take a look at some other areas. We'll focus in on that 12 o'clock and that Vario signage. Okay, so here we are, Vario, the font. We gotta talk about the font every time we review one of these micro brands. Uh, you know, it's a make or break for some people when they look at a watch and they're figuring out whether or not they wanna buy it. Now, one thing I will say, it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition because on one end, you have this very old school World War I, 19 teens aesthetic when we're looking at the watch as a whole, and then you have this Vario it's just, in, it's incredibly modern. I mean, look at it, that V, it looks like it's kind of almost alien or almost space age. Uh, very, very hyper modern font there. So it's a definite contrast between, you know, uh, the font on the signature and then uh, the actual whole aesthetic of the watch. I don't think it's a total eyesore, but if there was one complaint, it, it is that juxtaposition between the very old school aesthetic of the entire watch design and then the kind of modernization of that, that signature's font. But again, leave me in the comment, what do you think? When I reviewed uh, the Formex, uh, watch people were up in arms about the Formex font. So um, again, it is kind of very important to people and I don't blame them because when we look at a watch's dial, we're utilizing that to tell the time. So if there's something on the dial you don't like and it happens to be uh, the font that's on there, yeah, people are gonna get upset. So leave me in the comment, what do you think about that interesting contrast? And in this shot here, we can see that beautifully old school handset and again, that sub dial taking away. And we see a little bit of flecto coming off around the three o'clock of the crystal. Speaking of that crystal, this watch is utilizing a two millimeter double domed sapphire with inner anti-reflective coating applied. So again, uh, that is very nice to see because if this watch does sustain a few little bumps on the crystal. Uh, you don't have to worry about that AR coating scratching off and becoming kind of ugly. Um, so yeah, very, very nice. And people will be happy to know that there is a resilient sapphire uh, protecting this watch. Now, as I move this watch around, I really actually do enjoy how it plays with the light. I do want to talk about the finishing. Everything I can see in general looks good, but one thing I will say is this is, again, a media piece. It's been passed around to various journalists and reviewers, and uh, the case definitely has sustained a few little bumps and bruises. Um, so as we can see up here by the, pretty much from the 10 to the one o'clock, there's some pretty substantial scratches on the bezel there. Um, I think from here where it's more clean, you can see that they're going for a more polished bezel and a brushed case head. Uh, but then again, this, I don't think that this is going to be what's what you're going to receive as a you know production consumer model, but here as a media piece, this has been passed around and 
we can see it's it's extra rustic, really playing that role of a wartime watch. Um, we can see some some definite scratches over on the bezel. So all jokes aside, when we forgive those kind of superficial scratches, uh, it being a media piece, the watch is incredibly clean. Uh, there's nothing more disappointing than, than getting a cool watch into the office, getting close with the macro lens and seeing some imperfections, some sediment, some lint, under the crystal on the dial. I just, that's, it's, it's pretty much unforgivable in my opinion. Um, but with this macro lens, from what I can see, it looks pretty good. I'm um, looking at playback right now. Uh, and on the monitor, it looks good. If we zoom in to the second hand, there might be a bit of an imperfection there. Let me get up close, see if I can get even closer and see. So I'm gonna try to hone in on this. Gato, please uh, circle it right above the spindle on that small second hand. There is a little bit of an imperfection uh, on the finishing there. Um, again, Gato, please circle that for them. You cannot see it with the naked eye. Uh, it is like I'm hyper magnified with this macro lens. And then again, by the spindle here, there's a few little imperfections uh, on that minute hand. And then when we look at the big puffy kind of patinated uh, loom here on the two o'clock, there's a bit of a, of a, I don't wanna use the word crater, I'll use pit, there's a little pit uh, there on the two o'clock Arabic and then on the three o'clock Arabic as well. But again, uh, for being kind of the old school aesthetic, I think this watch kind of pulls it off because when we look at puffy loom, um, we're thinking of aged radium and aged tritium. And uh, when those compounds age, they kind of swell up and get kind of puffy and even flaky. And uh, no watch ages the same utilizing those materials, radium and tritium. And so I, if you got a watch and it looked like this, I, I don't think it'd be the, the worst thing in the world. But again, I review the watch I get, so I'm showing you everything I see. But aside from those imperfections, the watch looks pretty clean. And again, um, with this white dial, it would be far more disappointing to find you know, some dust or some dark lint in there, it would just be, it would be a disaster. So, so far, so good. Okie dokie, so now that we've gone over that dial with a fine tooth comb, let's flip this baby over and take a look at that Miyota 82S5 automatic. Um, we can see skeletonized rotor, uh, very, very beautiful movement. Again, not a whole lot of decoration, but what we do have here is very pleasant to the eye. Um, no horrendous tool marks, uh, you know, no mangled up screw heads. Everything looks pretty prim and proper. Not the most impressive movement out there, but again, uh, automatic movement. What is it, 21 joules as it says on the rotor. And uh, it does have hacking and hand wind and um, really no complaints back here. Again, there's nothing worse than absolutely thrashed screw heads on a case back. So um, yeah, very, very pleasant sight to see. Uh, everything looks pretty clean here, guys. All right, guys, now it's time for my second favorite thing to do. I, honestly, my first favorite thing to do is to test loom. I honestly think my only like purpose in life is to shine a flashlight on watches to watch them glow. Uh, I'm a very simple man, um, don't judge me. Anyway, let's break out the digital calipers and uh, check out the specifications as far as case measurements. Let's go. Widest point, excluding the crown and uh, excluding that bun strap. 37.1 millimeters at its widest point. Let's take a look at lug to lug. 44.1 millimeter lug to lug. And then uh, let's take a look at the thickness. Again, we're going to try to exclude uh, that bun strap there. So uh, the case itself, 11.6 millimeters thick, fairly reasonable. With that bun strap, uh, it will be 14 millimeters thick on the button. Okay guys, so for those of you wondering if that custard loom glows, heck yeah, that's pretty dang good. Let me shine it with my light. Yo, that's pretty impressive, guys. That minute hand and that hour hand are like a beacon right now. Uh, the big, the bigger uh, numerals, they're not glowing nearly as bright as the handset, but that's pretty normal. Uh, let me see. Yeah, great loom. 
No complaints there, guys. All right, here we go. Lavario 1918 trench watch on my wrist. For reference, I do have a seven and a half inch wrist. And I know some of you are probably taken aback by that 37 millimeter case diameter, but fear not. Um, it is kind of wearing a little bit larger with that bun strap. There is some added heft there. It's still in no way like a cumbersome heavy watch, but uh, very, very comfortable on the wrist. And in my opinion, you know, I prefer uh, that kind of sweet spot sub 40 millimeter watch case. So um, yeah, this is well within that sub 40 millimeter category. Um, so if you have smaller wrists than myself, I think you'll pull this off just fine. And if your wrists are a bit bigger than mine, I think you can wear it as well. I don't think that there will be any issue, but I know some people, uh, they're exclusively 40 millimeters and up. So if you are that person, this watch might not be for you. Okie dokie guys, so let's finally go over the spec sheet all in one go, uh, then we'll go over the price, and then I'll give you my conclusion, because we've spent a few minutes with this Vario, and I think I kinda, I got a feeling about this watch already. So, sub 40 millimeter case, I think that's a plus, right? Classically styled watch, well within that kind of classic sizing. Again, if you prefer larger watches, probably not the watch for you. What I will say is, although this is on the smaller side, it's incredibly easy to read, so no issue telling the time. Uh, double dome sapphire crystal, again, with underneath applied uh, anti-reflective coating. Everyone loves sapphire, no issues there. Stainless steel case, I think I already brought that up. We have fixed lugs, so I think that's very cool, very classic, and again, a little bit more resilient of a design choice there. Um, it does have a threaded crown with a 100 meter water resistance rating. So this is, although it is like kind of an old school looking watch, it's actually very functional and modern in its resilience. So no complaint there. Miyota 82S5 automatic movement. I'm not the biggest Miyota guy, but honestly, it keeps the cost down. You're getting hacking and hand wind. Uh, beautiful finishing, no issue there. Um, now, let's talk about the price. It will range, according to the spec sheet at the time of filming, from $250 to $350. I think that is very, very reasonable for this beautiful enamel dial with those big, bold, old school Arabic numerals. Very fun, interesting history. I mean, World War I was in no way fun, but very fun celebration of a very, very pivotal moment in the world's history. Uh, beautiful, beautiful small second sub dial. Uh, again, I like the bun strap. I like the whole aesthetic. The one thing that I would say is uh, the font contrast with that old school aesthetic. I think that's a little bit to wrap your head around, but all in all, I think it's a beautiful watch. And again, the spec sheet, Really nice specs. So guys, I wanna thank Vario for sending us this watch and sponsoring this channel because we can't do these Microbrand Monday episodes without the support from companies like Vario. Uh, you know, it takes a whole lot of guts for these companies to send me a watch. They know I'm gonna scrutinize it. They know I'm gonna get up close and personal with my macro lens, uh, and they know I'm gonna find any imperfections. So it shows us that they really do stand behind their products. So for all the companies that have helped us out with Microbrand Monday, we wanna thank them, and today, again, Vario, thank you for sponsoring the channel. Uh, thank you, the viewer, for watching this, because what's content without a viewer? Uh, so you freaking rock. Thank you to my channel members for making all the content we do here possible. If you want six pieces of content a week, that is two extra uh, each week, then please um, join the channel. It's like YouTube's Patreon. It's $4.99 a month, and again, you get six pieces of content each week with access to the members-only Discord chat. We do a live chat. It's literally like a group uh, hangout, like a group FaceTime, if you will, every single Wednesday, and that's for uh, the members only. So if you wanna hang out and do those things, then uh, consider joining the channel memberships. Guys, please check out all the affiliate links in the description below. There's a ton of ways to support the channel, but the easiest one is just to keep doing what you're doing and watching the, the content, guys. Seriously, can't thank you enough for getting me, I think, what, we're over 136,000 subscribers. Just insane, so thank you guys. I, I love each and every one of you. Like, comment, subscribe, share this with everyone you know. I'm Jory Goodman, the time teller, and always remember I didn't invent time, I just tell it. Yeah, yeah.